Okay, so welcome everyone um, to this um, Mental and Emotional Wellness Submit 2021. And today we are very privileged to have Adrian Lim Peng An with us. He's the founder and co uh, consultant psychologist of family. He's a counseling psychologist. He's a registered psychologist. He's also a registered social worker and supervisor. He's a registered counselor. He's also a lecturer at eight universities and polytechnics. And today he's going to share about strategies for psychological and emotional wellness using BPSS. So an uh, introduction about uh, Adrian. Today's uh, his sharing is about there are a variety of factors that constitute mental wellness using the theoretical framework. The biopsychosocial spiritual provides more holistic perspectives to formulate a comprehensive assessment so as to develop better practical strategies that can be readily put into practice for psychological and emotional well-being every day. So introduce Adrian, Adrian Lim. He's the founder and consultant psychologist of Family Counseling Psychologies with 29 years of professional clinical practice. He has a degree in so, uh, social work and psychology from NUS, a master applied psychology from NIE, NTU. He's also a certified um, a trainer. He's a registered psychologist and registered supervisor with Singapore Psychological Society, registered social worker and supervisor with Singapore Association of Social Workers and a life member. His third professional title is a registered counselor and a registered clinical supervisor with Singapore Association for Counseling and being a master clinical member. He has also been an adjunct lecturer at six universities and three polytechnics. He has provided clinical supervision for over 700 social workers, psychologists, and counselors. So Adrian has appeared 27 times on television and being interviewed on various uh, news channels like Mediacorp, uh, Channel News Asia, Star, War, uh, Star World, uh, plus also being on the radio like Go uh, 90.5, CNA 938 uh, and also capital 958. So without much ado, we are going to welcome Adrian Lim. Adrian. Hi. Let me share screen. Huh? Yes. Okay, here we go. Right. Takes a while to... All right, here we go. All right, welcome everyone to this session. I hope um, you have been uh, entertained in your cognitive area or understanding of various aspects of emotional and psychological wellness. Um, this is just want to run through who I am further. This is the many times I was on, on television and radio and all those things. I will be sharing how um, various aspects of my background. And I think it's important for you all to understand a little bit where I'm coming from. I've been doing work in many places from a medical social worker at NUH to a school social worker. I was the first school counsellor. I will show you all later the card. Uh, I was a program manager for fathers at school for Dads for Life movement, right? Which is my one of my passion in, in my role as a father myself, right? I was a master social worker with uh, MSF in the Family Service Centre Development Branch. I was a principal social worker with THK, uh, one of the family service center. I was a master social worker for a life community network. And the list goes on, right? Uh, I'm also currently also doing uh, uh, part-time work with, as a principal consultant for teacher wellness at Singapore Teachers Union. And this is where I we work with teachers, the, the 14,000 members, right? Out of the 33,000 uh, teaching workforce in Singapore, in the area of their wellness, mental, emotional, psychological wellness, right? Besides their teaching, because as you know, teaching is a very challenging for our profession and vocation, right? I was also doing project uh, consultant for SG Enable in terms of developing the uh, training roadmap for caregivers, right? Yeah. Okay, this is where I, I started. I was the first school counselor in Singapore. Actually, it was my study that got 
uh, MOE to eventually uh, get the first 20 full-time school counsellors in 2005, when I already started in 1997. I was very lonely at that time because being the only one in, in, in Singapore doing the work. Uh, that's why I was in Dex for Life uh, as a program manager for Fathers at School. Uh, this is where I'm currently working, uh, part of my work besides my own private practice. All right, this is my card. Okay, so all the pictures you can see from various settings that I was with, including some ministers I was with. Okay, I just want to share there. Are, these are a lot of other photos. I was also in the various um, areas, as you see, um, in talking about the study. The first study was the one that recommended to MOE to have full-time school councils in Singapore, where I rep that my study represented 67% of all secondary schools and there are loud and clear voices that we need professional social, social workers, school social workers and counsellors coming into schools to support our students. As, as our society progresses, there are also much, much more challenges in our schools. All right? I was plenary speaker for various areas in with anything dealing with school, whether it's teachers, parents or students. Right? I was also at the keynote speaker for the Gifted Education Program, uh, their 20th anniversary, you know. And I also, my study, uh, this was a study, Men's Transition to Fatherhood. I, I recommended to MOM that our fathers need at least seven days of paternity leave. And thank God in 2012 13, they actually really instituted the first um, um, mandatory seven days of paternity leave. And of course, now it's already increased to 15 days. Right? I was in other orders. I don't bore you the rest, but I'm basically working a lot with families, partnering, especially with the men as their role, as their fathers, coaching them and all that, all these things I presented. Let me just introduce very briefly. I don't, I will, biopsychosocial spiritual model is actually a progression from the biopsychosocial model, right? It added the spiritual element, right? Biology is everything to do with our our, our genetics, our setup. Our psychological development includes emotional um, issues that we go through, emotions, our, our psyche. The social aspect, this is a big one, which relates to our relationships, as particular with our families and our loved ones and the, our extended friends and our, even our working colleagues, right? The key is, and I will share with you a TED Talk, by a, by a Harvard professor and director on it later. I will share with you a very um, inspiring talk that tracked a 75-year-old study, right? That shows why, how important our relationships are. And finally, the social, the spiritual. And all this aspect of it will, will be shared with you in a 12-minute uh, video, all right? Uh, which is much more fun than listening to me. I would want to use that, that video to show you and explain deeper and, and much more uh, elaborate on the issue. But basically, the, this biopsychosocial spiritual model, right, is a systemic theory that connects and integrates various factors and more to assess an issue that we are going through, to plan the, the program and also intervene appropriately and holistically. Right, just, just rather than just looking at the one aspect, the biology, the medical aspect of it. All right, so now I will share with you the video for you all to listen. Uh, maybe I heard a bit, a bit soft, but enjoy this video and it can go into very chim and very deep. Huh? Just want to let you know, but this is a very informative video that you can even look out on your own. All right, here we go. The biomedical model of medicine has been around since well before the 1960s as the predominant model used by physicians in diagnosing diseases. According to the biomedical model, health constitutes the freedom from biological malfunctioning of the human body, aka disease. Thus, the average human condition is healthy. The models focus on the physical processes, for example, pathology, biochemistry, and physiology of a disease, do not take into account the role of social factors or individual subjectivity. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, medicine, as it is now, was changing rapidly. Dr. George Libman Engel, an American internist and psychiatrist at the University of Rochester, 
wrote a seminal work describing the need for the biomedical model of medicine to change to the biopsychosocial model. Dr. Engels posited that while the biomedical model is excellent for describing certain disease mechanisms, for example, viral illnesses, it has difficulty accounting for psychological and sociological factors that influence most, if not all, illnesses. However, he only mentions spiritual factors in terms of pre-scientific medicine and spirituality being used to explain psychological processes at that time. He does not acknowledge the positive or negative impact of spirituality on a patient's well-being, quality, and longevity of life. Thankfully, over the last few decades, there is overwhelming support for addressing the biopsychosocial needs of patients as that has led to better outcomes. But there is also ample evidence to address the spiritual needs of patients. Dr. Harold G. Koenig is a psychiatrist on the faculty of Duke University. He has published over 280 scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals and 60 chapters in professional books. Throughout his career, he has helped establish some of the main tenets regarding why addressing spirituality in medicine is necessary. These reasons are as follows. One, spiritual beliefs are common among patients and serve a distinct purpose. Two, spiritual beliefs influence medical decision-making. Three, there is a relationship between faith and health. Four, many patients would like their doctors to address issues of faith and health. Five, addressing spiritual beliefs with patients often improves the doctor-patient relationship. Due to an exuberance of data regarding the benefits of addressing spirituality in healthcare, the AAMC has added to their guidelines for creating medical school objectives in their most recent update. They state, in order to communicate effectively with patients, physicians will also need to understand how a person's spirituality and culture affect how they perceive health and illness, and particularly their desires regarding end-of-life care. This notion has also translated to the accrediting body for hospitals called the Joint Commission, whose most recent standards state that a spiritual assessment should, at minimum, identify and accommodate a patient's cultural, religious, spiritual beliefs or practices that influence care in every aspect from food to medicines to end of life. This assessment involves determining the patient's denomination and beliefs, as well as what spiritual practices are important to the patient. Finally, the American Psychiatric Association has also recommended that physicians ask about the spiritual orientation of patients so that they may properly attend to them in the course of treatment. Briefly, before going any further, according to the Oxford Dictionary, spirituality originates from the Latin word spiritus, which means breath. And like breath, the spirit is regarded as a fundamental part of being alive. It is defined as the non-physical part of a person, which is a seat of emotions and character, the soul the thing regarded as their true self and is capable of surviving physical death or separation. Thus, spirituality is anything that pertains to the non-physical part of a person. Despite these definitions, there are some misconceived notions regarding spirituality. Namely, there is a common misconception that spirituality equates to religion. However, it is much more than that. For example, religion focuses on organized beliefs, solitary and social practices, while spirituality encompasses those things, as well as other aspects of interacting with one's higher power, like prayer, meditation, and a relationship. Another common misconception is that spirituality equates to faith. However, spirituality only overlaps with faith in some regards. For example, one can have faith in physical objects, such as faith that a medication will help lower blood sugar, while spirituality deals with anything non-physical. Another example is faith that prayer will help lower one's blood pressure while continuing to take medications. This second example shows how spirituality can work in terms of faith, specifically faith and a spiritual effect on the body, while maintaining continued faith in the physical medications affecting the body. Dr. David Holmes, a family medicine physician and director of global health education at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, demonstrated the concept in this way. In the sphere of religion are the acts and practices of a spiritual nature, while faith is a belief in or about the physical and non-physical world, while spirituality is anything pertaining to the non-physical world. Within this definition, I will discuss how the biopsychosocial spiritual model interacts with a patient's healthcare. From a biological perspective, it is often very clear how patients may be affected by diseases. For example, hepatitis C, although unseen on a shared needle, will chronically infect 60 to 80 percent of individuals using those needles. Over a 3 to 12 week period, these individuals will be asymptomatic until the virus has begun, causing them to have weakness, malaise, anorexia, and other nonspecific flu-like symptoms. Ultimately, this virus culminates in liver decompensation and death at a variable rate if not addressed with antiviral medications. Nutrition is another very crucial component of health within the biological sphere of the biopsychosocial model. For example, 
A diet in excess of recommended caloric intake has been shown to cause type 2 diabetes through insulin resistance and elevated blood fatty acid levels leading to cardiac disease and premature death. However, nutrition can also have very positive health outcomes. Beyond disease prevention, it has been shown to increase longevity of life and mood. One way that altering nutrition is able to increase longevity of life and mood was explained at length in a review article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The authors describe how overweight, young, and middle-aged adults who fast for 16 hours twice a week can have broad-spectrum benefits for many conditions such as obesity, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, cancers, and even neurologic disorders. Exercise also has a deep link within the biological sphere of the model. Not only does increased daily exercise prove to be effective in lowering BMI and the risk of heart disease, but it is even effective in treating other seemingly unrelated diseases. In a case report in the International Journal of Rehabilitation Research, a 48-year-old male with a diagnosis of Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome confirmed with MRI was treated with detox, intramuscular thiamine, eight weeks of intensive physical rehabilitation, and had improved his mini mental status exam score from 10 out of 30 to 20 out of 30. Thus, the combination of exercise and nutrition significantly improved his cognitive functioning, the biology of his brain, and quality of life. Vaccines are biochemical tools used to prevent disease in the individual and society, providing longevity and improved quality of life. This has been demonstrated by the mortality of diphtheria, polio, measles, rubella, and smallpox declining by greater than 99% since the institution of vaccines. However, simply having access to these vaccines does not make them accepted by all patient populations. Therefore, good education and abundance of respect empathy, and evidence while taking into consideration the whole person being treated are necessary for interventions like these to be efficacious via adherence. As I begin to discuss how psychological factors are innately tied to health, I will attempt to synthesize how a patient's psychology affects their biology and vice versa. First, there are many major components of a patient's psychology that affect their health outcomes. From a multinational review that sifted through 15,000 research papers and found 20 relevant studies of the various psychological components that affect patient health outcomes through physical activity, the authors found that emotions, perceptions, motivations, goals, personality, values, intelligence, and understanding of the benefits of activity all had positive effects on patient physical activity, while the presence of psychological disorders like depression had a negative effect. Another example of the psychological state of an individual affecting outcomes is well known in the population of patients diagnosed with chronic liver disease, as there is a larger burden of depression than that of the general population. In fact, the mortality of patients diagnosed with chronic liver disease is not only due to irreversible cirrhosis, but also complications like hepatocellular carcinoma and mental diseases, especially depression. In a study from 2015 by the Liver International Journal, the authors demonstrated that patients without liver disease and suffering from major depression attempted suicide 13% of the time, while those with liver disease attempted suicide 33% of the time. Multiple studies have found that patients with viral hepatitis C have a higher prevalence of depression, but there is also an association with individuals receiving interferon alpha treatment for the disease. Studies that investigated the link between interferon alpha treatment and depression found that ethnicity modulates the genetic risk for depression with therapy, and that polymorphisms in the promoter region of interferon alpha beta receptor 1 can increase the risk of developing depression in hepatitis C patients who are receiving antiviral treatments. Thus, multiple studies have concluded that treatment of comorbid diseases are the most likely to result in therapy success, as many patients with depression can become non-compliant or succumb to the thoughts of suicide. Interestingly, in an animal model of reduced dopamine-producing gut microbes, the process of cirrhosis was accelerated, and ongoing research is looking at the link between neuropsychiatric dopamine processes like depression and acceleration of physical diseases like cirrhosis. Finally, from a psychological perspective, physicians can help provide education to mitigate the possibility of poor outcomes from things like not understanding the need to take medications for type 2 diabetes because of a lack of a feeling of their effect. Socially, patient health is directly affected by their socioeconomic status as that influences medication affordability, access to healthcare services in geographic locations, access to healthy foods, access to safe exercising locations, access to lead-free or allergen and pollution-free living conditions, access to low-violence environments, access to appropriate working conditions, and many, many other things. 
Other social factors include insurance status, as there are many studies that estimate that people without insurance die quicker. The inability to work is also a social predictor of death. Family and friend influences can also have effects on a patient's health, like betel chewing, and social circumstances, and likelihood of cirrhosis. Furthermore, decades of studies demonstrate that people who join support groups for their respective diseases or struggles have better health outcomes, and those who volunteer and help others have better outcomes than those who do not. These examples don't even demonstrate the impact that one's culture can have, both in negative and positive ways, on a patient's health. However, culture must be a component of whole person health care for the best outcomes in medicine to be achieved. Spirituality is a necessary component of the whole person health care model. This is in large part due to spiritual behaviors having positive effects on a patient's coping mechanisms via prayer and meditation. Additionally, spirituality has positive effects on a patient's social life and psychological circumstances through religious service attendance. Importantly, some medical decisions are often influenced by a patient's religious affiliation. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses cannot accept whole blood, and pork derivatives are not acceptable for Muslim populations. Furthermore, a large body of research has now emerged suggesting that religious participation is strongly associated with numerous positive health and well-being outcomes. Longitudinal studies that control for confounding variables indicate that religious service attendance is associated with greater longevity, less depression, less suicide, better cancer and cardiovascular survival, less divorce, greater likelihood of making new friends and social support, greater life satisfaction, greater meaning and purpose in life, more charitable giving, and greater civic involvement. While many of the earlier studies were methodologically weak, there are now, for the outcomes and references listed above, rigorous studies with longitudinal designs, large sample sizes, and extensive confounding control, including control for baseline outcomes, suggesting associations of fairly substantial magnitude. Knowing that spirituality can have such a significant effect on a patient's health is important because we have developed tools for assessing current spiritual behaviors and thus determining areas that could be improved and positively affect health. One such tool is taking a spiritual history with a mnemonic HOPE, developed by Brown University School of Medicine. H stands for hope, meaning comfort, strength, peace, love, and connection. One way of asking this is, we have been discussing your support systems. I was wondering, do you have any religious or spiritual beliefs that act as a source of comfort and strength in dealing with life's ups and downs? O stands for organized religion. One way to ask about this is, are you part of an organization such as a temple, mosque, synagogue, church, etc.? And I think the most important question to sneak into this is, how important is this to you? P stands for personal spirituality and practices. One way to ask this is, do you have personal spiritual beliefs that are independent of organized religion? Like, do you believe that you gather strength from nature, society, or a sense of balance? And this question can be tailored based on prior answers. If they state that they do have an organized religion, ask, what kind of relationship do you have with God? And what aspects of your spirituality or spiritual practices do you find most helpful to you personally? like meditation, prayer, reading scripture, attending religious services, listening to music, hiking, or communing with nature. E stands for effects on medical care and end-of-life issues. This can be asked in this way. As a doctor, is there any way that I can help you to access the resources that usually help you? And are you worried about any conflicts between your beliefs and your medical situation, cares, or decisions? By taking inventory of a patient's spirituality, you can also identify potential interactions with your healthcare management strategies. For example, the patient's beliefs and practices may be contradictory or uphold evidence-based medicine. And by obtaining a spiritual inventory, one can gain the appropriate insight into how to address these beliefs effectively. Often, doing a comprehensive physical exam in history is not possible. Thus, there must be some discussion of when these types of interventions are best implemented. First, in inpatient and outpatient settings. The order of operations is to establish as follows. You take care of medical needs before all else. A patient with a broken arm may want prayer and the ability to push through rosary beads or open the Bible, but first you must fix the arm. Then taking care of the psychosocial needs takes precedent. A patient who does not trust, is delusional, is in a current episode of psychosis, cannot currently discuss their higher level needs. Thus, it is important to address those first. Finally, addressing the socio-spiritual needs of hospitalized patients requires forming trust and sympathy with the patient, providing a desirable environment, 
appropriate communication from the medical team with the patient, and respecting the patient's dignity and beliefs. Of note, addressing spiritual needs can always be done during a general physical, work physical, or sports physical. Another scenario where the biopsychosocial spiritual needs must be addressed is in terms of addiction, as it has been shown that the most effective methods for treatment of addiction are those with appropriate medication, counseling, support in groups that believe or rely on a higher power. The last scenario I want to mention is one of the most paramount for physicians to address spirituality, and one of the most difficult, and that is during end-of-life care. For a thorough analysis, I'll walk through a case report. A 43-year-old pregnant woman with a history of prior C-section, T-shaped uterus, hypothyroidism, fibromyalgia, and depression was found to be giving birth to a boy with Patau syndrome, aka trisomy 13, and suspicion for placenta accreta. Due to the complicated nature of the baby's presentation, a birth plan discussion including the baby's poor chance of survival, the difficulty of the mother's surgery, and how the family wished to deal with having a healthy or dying baby took place. The obstetric department took a team approach, involving a palliative care physician, nurse practitioner, social worker, and genetic counselor, in order to understand the family's anticipatory grief. At birth, the baby was healthy enough to be handed to the father in a special blanket made by the mother while mom received a hysterectomy. In a short period of time, the baby became weak and with little respiratory effort. He was immediately baptized and blessed by the priest in the delivery room. While attempting to stimulate the baby and provide skin contact with mom, she needed to undergo additional anesthesia for the hysterectomy. Accompanied by staff, the father brought the baby to eager siblings. Shortly thereafter, the mother's surgery was ending, and instead of a normal protocol of post-anesthesia unit, the mother was brought to the room with the family and the appropriate staff for her monitoring. Due to the physician's commitment to reuniting her with the baby, she was able to hold him while he died peacefully and then perform rituals they had previously identified to be important for their closure, including a teardrop card outside the door for staff to be respectful of the circumstances, and molds, pictures, keepsakes, and a memory box. After their son's funeral, they wrote the team, Thank you for the support and prayers during our stay. The difficult time was made easier due to your efforts. In conclusion, when taking care of patients, it is imperative that we as physicians attempt to provide care that will most effectively impact our patient's health and well-being. This involves addressing, in a patient-centered approach, the physical, mental, social, and spiritual components of their being. Of note, praying for patients who ask for it has been shown to have tremendous benefits for patient-doctor relationships, which in many cases can be the crux of therapeutic efficacy through alliance, and also makes the care of terminally ill less frustrating and more fulfilling. The bottom line is that in order to accomplish highest quality patient-centered care, one must A. Take a biopsychosocial spiritual history. B. Address any of those issues as needed. C. Utilize patient sources of strength and support as tools to help patients to optimize their health and well-being. D. Consider praying with patients if there are indications to do so as per Dr. Koenig's book. And E. If indicated, consider referring patients to clergy, social, spiritual support groups, or counselors, just as we refer to other medical specialties. All right. I hope that has given you a perspective of what is the BPSS. And this is talking about in the medical setting. And it's so important to involve the whole team, right? It's a whole person's approach. Right, and the inclusion of that spiritual component is so important, working together with the biological, psychological, and social factors. Right, and I just just a summary of the key benefits, including including all those things. Right, okay. So let me just talk about the strategies using the PPSS. Right, I think many of the speakers they have shared and going to share in this um, summit we'll be talking about many things from water to antioxidants, right? I just want to highlight some of these things here in the BPSS model. When we talk about antioxidants, right? We're thinking about healthy food, right? Taking the necessary minerals, right? Whether it's water, whether it's vitamins and all those things, right? One of the things that we, we tend to neglect is this simple yet often forgotten deep breathing. And here I, I'm talking about breathing through the 
solar plexus or into your stomach, better known as a stomach, uh, holographic breathing, which means you don't breathe in to your lungs, right? And the aspect of it is breathing in a way that can come. And you can do it anytime, right? While waiting for transport, while you're getting angry with somebody, deep breathing into your stomach. Let me just stand up and show. Uh. Pato, uh, stomach here. Uh. So you breathe in. Uh. Not, not the chest, but the stomach. Oftentimes forgotten, but very useful, very effective. Especially when you combine it with closing your eyes, listening to your favorite soothing symphonic uh, music, or something soothing that will help you calm is very helpful in your calming yourself down and helping you relax, right? Especially in the middle, let's say you just go for a toilet break, you just need to do a two-minute breathing before you go back to a very stressful meeting will help you a lot, okay? And another thing, hydrate. Nah? And here comes uh, something all of us know, Oh, eight cups of water, right? Mm -hmm. Eight cups, ah. Sorry, ah. I, I had an a, a encounter with a urologist. And know what, you know what she told me? Because I encountered some issues ah, by myself. Ah. She said, actually, all the, the study says eight cups, not enough. In fact, you must produce eight cups of urine. Ah not drink it cups, which especially we are living in a tropical, hot country and humid country as Singapore, right? And we need to hydrate. Don't wait until you are thirsty before you drink water, right? Okay, you see all these bottles here, right? I take at least three to four liters of water every day, right? And of course, um, uh, Veronica can talk about all type of, all type of water. Lah, right? my, my point here is you need to hydrate. One of the key elements is this. Uh, what's the color of your urine? All right? Do you know, if you go to the sports school in Singapore, right, in Woodlands, in every toilet cubicle, do you see, if you turn the, when you, the, the teacher or the, the, the athlete, the student want to pee, uh, there's a chart put in front of them, right? And say that what's the color of your urine, right? It has to be clear, as clear as possible, or maybe a bit uh, colored, but once you hit brown, uh, you need to hydrate. And if it's a certain color, you're already dehydrated, you need to see the position inside the sports school. Is that serious? Okay? And you, of course, you can hear about people running marathons or even in the army boys, uh, right? Fall, fall down and then dehydrate, right? Whether it's um, uh, heat stroke or, or, or dehydration, very important, okay? The other aspect is sleep. And I can give a whole talk on its own for sleep hygiene, right? Just know that it's not only the amount of hours that you are sleeping, but also the quality of sleep, okay? Sadly, Singapore has the lowest number of sleep in the whole world, okay? In a 2007 nationally representative study, right, by MOM, right, the work-life study, the average Singaporean worker of 1,600 uh, workers that was interviewed, a representative, very expensive, multi-million dollar study, uh, which I have... I attended the, the briefing by International Panel of Researchers, found that each year, that was in 2007, right? We average Singaporean lose 500 hours, 500 hours of sleep. Uh, if you use eight hours, which means about 6.4 hours of sleep. I don't know about now, 14 years later, right? we are really sleep deprived. And literally, we can, can die from the lack of sleep. And then there's even uh, Channel News Asia uh, a documentary about sleep, dying to sleep, uh, I still remember. The other aspect on top of biological is the exercise, right? 
stretching is key, you right? Or else our bones, our muscle tendons will fossilize. We were just talking to my wife earlier, right? We will fossilize, right? Okay, in Chinese, uh, 如果痛, right? Means 不痛, <laughs> right? And if it's 痛了, then 不会痛, Okay, so it's important because our body is a circular tree system, right? Everything interacting together, right? And it is found besides stretching, walking. That's why the government in, through HPV is giving money to people to walk 10,000 steps. There is so much research to say that we need to walk. Why? When we walk, we're actually pumping our circulation system. We are helping our heart because when we walk, the bumps actually cause that ripple effect to our body for better circulations, right? And uh, the government is not giving us free money, but actually give, paying us to stay healthy. The third one I want to just highlight is muscle strengthening. How many of you are already in your 40s, 50s or, or older? Muscles, if you do not exercise, as I'm not, I'm not talking about going to the gym. I'm talking about just strengthening muscles. Even as you carry, go to your supermarket, carry things, uh, instead of using a trolley, carry your arms. Uh, I know it's very strong, uh, right? But it is important. Every day, things we can do to stretch and to strengthen exercise, right? Just hang yourself. I can tell you, just within my, my small area in my where I live, uh, there are four exercise stations, right? The government is really investing in our health. You just have to hang in the bar. I'm not asking you to do pull up. I'm not asking you to do push up. Just stretch and strengthen your muscles. So very important because when we do that, we will lower our, our uh, uh, osteoporosis, right? We will build up more circulation. We will also allow a lot of protein and to be cleared out of our system, especially those with, with all sorts of uh, chronic pains, you know, um, that can affect our well-being. I move on to psychological. Getting into new or modified routines is important, especially I'm talking about now in the last one and a half years, we have all been affected, not us, but the whole world. We need to, in order for us to thrive, we need to establish and modify our usual routines, right? Like, I think I'm sure Veronica will know, right? If we, if we organize this, we'll be a, a, a open seating and face-to-face -face, uh, like auditorium. But because of this, we are doing it over the media now, using IT to help us connect with each other. But routine helps us to maintain a sense of normalcy a sense of certainty, right? And I will talk a little bit later about what our pandemic has caused us and around the world. The number of people suffering from mental health illness, all right, have increased by at least 20 to 30%. I was at a webinar for Malaysia uh, Psychological uh, and um, Health uh, about two weeks ago that was organized. About 30% of their population that have been through the, the Ministry of Health found that they have mental health condition that started in the last one and a half years, right? And not only in, in Malaysia, all over the world, whether it's in Japan, in Korea, in Africa, in, in South America, um, in South Africa, in Brazil, right? We had an international conference, right? Sometime last October, Right, where each of the psychological and uh, psychiatric um, uh, departments of universities presented. Right? And, and just remember, we are not alone in our struggle. Right? And therefore, we need our, to have the perspective right, to really focus on what we can. In our psychological aspect, it's also focusing on, on our blessings right? and look and reframing our situation. Right, I give you an example what I mean by reframing. Huh? Right, we can say, oh, this is a curse, lah. You know, it's very sweet to have this. You know, we 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 are are doomed. Instead of saying all this negative uh, view of the of what is happening, 
why not seize it as an opportunity? Remember, in a Chinese uh, word called crisis, it means wei ji. Wei means danger, ji means ji hui, which is opportunity. So therefore, we need to learn, right, to reframe our perspective. So instead of saying that uh, yo, we are stuck at a house, we cannot do this, we cannot do that, why not say that, hey, now I can learn to, I've been waiting to uh, do a hobby like baking or gardening, all right? why not turn this adversity into an opportunity to learn? And I tell you, you know, last year, sugar, flour, all went out of stock, you know. Why people are learning to bake and, they are, and people go on to YouTube to talk about baking and sharing about how, what, how what type of cookies, what type of, what type of cakes they make, right? And something better still, made into a business, right? So let's look things in the half full rather than the half empty in a, in a cup, right? In a cup, we always see half full, half empty. So the perspective where we take our lenses, we have to modify all right, and, the, and what is it is we need to focus on being life-giving. What do you mean by life-giving? Instead of the scare-giving scare media that we are working, look at the life-giving, how we can use ourselves to be giving life than sucking life out of all of us. So very important for us to focus on what are the possibilities rather than the alama al oh dear, and all sorts of perspective we have. You will have that, but let's turn it to, to not only positive thinking, but life-giving possibilities. Look for the low bounds. The, look at the, uh, at the brighter side of perspective and see what we can seize the opportunity that we are given. All right? Third one is social. Staying relationally connected and our we explain much further by the TED Talk as I sh uh, show you later, right? Um, using tech to actually com compensate for the lack of connection, okay? What we cannot do is touch, but we can always go back to our photos if we cannot connect. Like for me, I cannot connect with my dad during the, the my 89-year-old father, right? But we can, I can send videos, <laughs> right? To, to, to wish him have Father's Day, that kind of thing, right? So we need to think out of the box, out of the lobang to actually come up with perspective. And I must emphasize this, and it will be shown later, belonging to a kampong, a community is very important, right? It's our intimate connection with people that we can count on who will accept us for who we are and only what we can do. And that's where, what makes the difference between true friends uh, and only fair-weathered friends. Uh. And I, I don't have to go too much on the spirituality, but basically in my terms, I say that finding personal purpose and own meaning right, to our experience. We have to find a meaning. And let me share with you one personal uh, experience I had, right? La and I shared it actually at a, a program in, in Catholic SG Radio, right? Um, my son has special needs. He's 21 years old. Uh, this, this two weeks ago, he turned 21. But last year, he, you know, when, when the circuit breaker started, we could not have, um, he not, cannot go to his day activity center, okay? And he cannot go... Uh, to the playground or the exercise corner and all that, okay? So what happened is, and he said, Dad, doesn't Mr. Lee understand that we have special needs? We need our routine. We need to have, uh, to do the things that we enjoy. Now we are all stuck at home. And, and, and what can we do? And then we had to really come in, our BPSS to come in, you know? consulted with his psychiatrist, consulted with his uh, physiologist and all that to help him. Huh? So the strategy that we came up is to go for walks. Morning, about 9 to 10 a.m. Evening, between 4 to 5 p.m. Right? So maybe 6. And each walk will be about 2 to 3, sometimes 4 kilometers. Even today, I just walk with him. 
for 2.3 kilometers. And I think I have to do that. I have to do a webinar. I have to come back earlier, right? But it was a challenge because, you know, at that time, everything is taped up. Cannot go this, cannot touch that. So what happened? I, I, I was really, he was shouting. He was um, very angry with the situation. I miss my friends. I miss my coach and all. What I did in my own spirituality, uh, in my own belief, uh, I well, can say, oh, I can, I can curse and I can swear why it's happening to me is so difficult. He has difficulty sleeping and all those things. Uh. So beside the medical, the bio part that was settled by, by medicine that can help, uh, what I did was bring him for walks to burn out his energy, and, but more importantly, how I reframe my own mind, psychologically and spiritually, I'm combining. Uh, I, at that time, was in April, and in my faith tradition as a Catholic, I actually saw this opportunity, what we call the Stations of the Cross, right? Each, every section that I walked with him around my, my estate where I live, I saw it as a, a, a step-by-step and in my, and let me just share in my own, Station of the Cross is just before Good Friday where Jesus um, uh, was led to Calvary to be crucified, right? And these are all the stations. Jesus falls the first time, the second time. I begin to see that my walking with him is to connect myself with my own God. To be able to see that perspective that I am connecting myself Right? And I can offer up uh, my challenge here, my so-called suffering here, to connect with what my Savior has done for me. Right? To be, and this is where I combine uh, bio, psychological reframing, and the spiritual as meaning. What's the meaning uh, of all of this? You know? And many parents uh, of children with special needs, uh, sometimes they say it's a burden, uh, it's a curse. Uh, but it's actually, if you see it and you grow in maturity, you will see it as a gift. Because through that experience that I had with him, right, I was able to see the opportunity to grow my own character. I learned patience. I learned to breathe in, breathe out, to calm myself down. I'm practicing what I preach. I'm able to pray as I walk. I use that walk, that daily walk, as a form of prayer, right? In nature, with the sun, to help me and my son sleep better because vitamin D from the sun will help us sleep. So I'm combining the BPSS in my own life. And I said, this is a wonderful perspective to share, right? I also learn about Christian meditation. Every Monday night, we'll go on meditation. Right? And by the way, you can also go on to YouTube uh, if you want to, to see Mr. our late and great Mr. Lee Kuan Yew being taught about Christian meditation uh, right, by a Benedictine monk. Right? And it was it's still on YouTube. You just key in Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Christian meditation, and you can find that video. Okay? I mean, it's very... Uh, inspiring to hear him what he says about how Christian meditation has actually helped our late founder of Singapore cope through the loss of his wife, right? The late Mrs. Lee after his death. Because all of us were worried, you know, you know, he was so lovingly close to a wife that uh, after his death he will go through grief uh, and may not recover. Right? But it is true the introduction by his good friend. Uh, and, and, and support that will be help him actually go through that difficult period, right? And therefore, we need to combine all this, right? Is this the search for ultimate meaning of our purpose? You know, what are we on earth uh, here for, right? What we need to find the, our purpose, our meaning, our significance, right? In relation to one's ourselves, our family, our community, even nature and the sacred and through our beliefs, values, traditions, and practices. All these things will make a lot of sense, but we need to work 
heart, H-E-A-R-T, uh, work our heart and our minds together, uh, not just work hard, H-A-R-D, to earn the S11, uh, right? S11 has a function, but we need to really find our purpose in life. Okay, I, will, I hope that it has been helpful. I will move on this, how it is applicable even on TV. Right? I've used the BPSS. Remember the Thai cave rescue in 2018, the Thai boys were locked in. I was interviewed twice, right, about this rescue. The first part I will not show, all right, which is here, right, when they, they first found the first six boys were eventually discovered and rescued. And this was the second, I want to show this second interview, very short clip, right, about how I use the BPSS to explain to the audience uh, on national TV how it is being used. Let's watch. Health, but psychologically or psychological health is often much more difficult to monitor. To look at this issue, we have family counseling psychologist Adrian Lim uh, Peng An joining us in studio tonight for more on this. Adrian, are you were here as well yes. in studio with us watching. Part uh, two. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and you were here with us uh, for that uh, yes. media conference that we saw just yes, now, that yes, news conference. Yes. Uh, what was your take on it? The boys seemed in, in quite good spirits, actually. They were yeah. crack, yeah. cracking jokes and it all yeah. seemed quite light. Yeah, I think, I think they're just, they just waiting to go home, to back to their lives, especially back to their families. You know, I think they have, they have bonded way beyond the extended time, you know. I think it's at least 21 days or more than that. Right. Right, yeah. So, you know, the um, news conference, we right. were told that um, the questions had to be vetted. Yes. Um, so that they wouldn't, um, you know, ask, um, the awkward. reporters wouldn't ask awkward or inappropriate yes. questions. Do you think that was uh, actually very wise? Yes, definitely. Because um, it's important to respect their readiness to reveal. Okay. Right? Uh, we have our own space, our own timing. And in order for us to be uh, appropriately timed, when, so that it will help us not to be prematurely uh, thinking or uh, answering things that they are, they are not ready to face up to. So, and you must understand they are all in the different age range. Eh? So you need to be uh, very, very respectful, especially in the Thai culture. Respect is very important, you know, and, and given their the, the, the age, you know, and their experience, we, we need to give them time. And that's why there's an embargo on all sorts of questions, especially using up thereafter, after this conference and they go home, not to be tailed, not to be, you know, um, uh, asked all, all sorts of questions. I'm sure the school will also follow suit, following the psychiatrist and the psychologist uh, directions. Yeah, we did hear advice yeah. from them saying that they wanted yes. them to be treated normally and yes. fairly and no special yes. treatment, but also... Yes. Uh, if they are asking questions and they don't want to answer them, they're not to be pushed. Yes, yes, yeah. They have to be say, I'm not ready or no. What are yeah. some of the symptoms that, you know, we should, uh, one should be looking out for, for these kids, you know, because they, they, the news conference, they were in such good spirits, yeah. they were laughing, yeah. it was humorous. Yes. But what are some of the telltale signs that perhaps, you know, they could be, um, for lack of a better word, you know, having some post-traumatic um, uh, yeah. stress? Um, I think some of the possibilities are flashbacks, you know. I'm sure um, they will have that kind of experience going back when they're, they're sleeping, when they're awake, you know. It will happen anytime, you know. So that's why they are, they are, the social workers over there will be following up with them along with the school teachers and, you know, to look at it. And I think it's important um, that they, I, I'm sure they have prepared this when they are in hospital. You know, telling them what to look out for, not only for themselves, but each other, mm. right? So that um, people can pick up and they recognize them, some symptoms, flashbacks, cold sweats, you know, sudden jerks, you know, and then is it real? Am I really out? You know, it, it, kind of, it will and it may happen. Uh, on, the, on the other side of that, mm. uh, it's a sort of life experience that yes. would draw people together yes. And, yes. and as they are a football team anyway they already yes. have a, a close-knit bond but it yeah. seems like they also then that extended out to the navy seals that were yes. that were rescuing them yeah yeah i think i think it's a very comforting uh image to see four other men coming into the picture after nine days you know the first two uh, british uh, divers who discovered them and staying with them throughout the rest of that ordeal mm. Right, and I think I, I mean, Thai culture is already a very um, close knit, you know, lots of respect, a lot of love, a lot of empathy, you know, and I think 
that's, that's part of the Buddhist uh, culture and, uh, and the belief system and all that. And, and I believe that will, has and will continue to help them. Right. It was you know, definitely life-changing because uh, you know, some of them, before they went in, some right. of them wanted to be professional footballers. Yes. And then after this entire episode, you know, with the closeness that yes. they developed with yeah. the um, Navy SEALs, some yeah. of them also want to be um, in Navy yeah. SEALs. So yeah. you know, how much do you think it would have, it, this experience would have changed them? Uh, definitely, it will change their perspective. I think it's a lot out of sheer, again, the word respect. You know, they risk their life to come all the way. Every one of the of the divers, right, risk their life going in and out. You know, anything could have happened. They could have slipped. They could have the the, the ropes being severed and all whatsoever. So I think they are very grateful. And and I, I going back to the idea of the, the meditative state. Probably they have been meditating also increase the sense of empathy. That is one of the, of the benefits of, of uh, mind, mindfulness uh, practices and also uh, meditation. Uh, staying on meditation, yeah. it, it was reported as well that their mm. coach, uh, Eka, had, you know, had been a monk in training yes. in before and had experience right. with that and, and had taught the kids yes. uh, to meditate as a way yes. of not just passing time, but yeah. also sort of keeping sane, I suppose, yes. in, in that yeah. situation. Yeah, definitely. You know, going back to my bio, psycho, social, spiritual, I think there's a lot to, to use this as a lesson. You know, biologically, they are fit, right? I mentioned that. Mm. Um, psychologically, they are already growing up and they are in the team. And that's linked a lot to the social aspect, the, the, the rapport, the relationship and the trust that they have. But the, psych, the spiritual aspect of it, Right? I think that is what ties into everybody. Because can you imagine you close your eyes, open your eyes, it's still dark. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can only listen to each other. Touch and hearing are the two only senses that are activated throughout this. You know? And that kind of uh, connectedness is beyond a normal, any normal ordeal that you have gone through mm -hmm. you know, for that long. So, and, and when you do meditation, the, um, the body mechanisms, metabolism slows down. That's why they can survive so long. Remember, it's a small area of pocket of air. Oxygen level will have gone to, into very seriously low. And if you go below 15 to 12 percent, it will be toxic. You know, they can go into serious breathing issues. But meditation from the research right, in the US and the UK have shown when they are in a state of meditation, not only your heart rate goes down, your pulse rate goes down, your metabolism goes down, the oxygen intake and the carbon dioxide outtake is also goes is lesser. So it does not affect, uh, it keeps the level, even as they measured about 15%. It's amazing for so long in that small crevice that they were in. Right. right. You know, following up on um, sp spirituality mm. and mindfulness, we know that immediately, you know, what the boys will be doing, one of the first yes. things that the boys will be doing is they're going to be ordained mm. as um, Buddhist monks, yeah. part of their culture. Do you think sure. that will also help in their yes, recovery? Yes, I think, I, I guess, it was mentioned by, by the, the, it was that it's, a, it's also a form of repentance, you know, and also respect, again, what the, their coach who was a former monk has done, and also again our respect for the for the naval uh, seal diver who has passed away, uh, Salmon. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of reason for them to do it. Anyway, there is also part of their culture for boys to go through a short stint, right? But I think they are doing it together mm. again, together, out of a mark of respect for everybody and for themselves and for their families. That acts as a, perhaps another form of discipline for yes, them as well and helps in their recovery. Yeah. And it safe them. Mm. Would this way, right. you know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for speaking yeah. to us. Um, you know, we've been speaking there to family counseling psychologist Adrian Lim Peng An. All right. I hope that you enjoyed um, the clip. All right. Um, just to be it, uh, the walk that I had with my son. Uh, I, I'm looking at my. We have already completed. 1,000, nearly 1,490 kilometers uh, since April the 4th of last year. 1,486 kilometers. But I can walk to where already? I think I can walk to China already, 1,400 and back. I'm going to share with you the last video before I share about some case studies. And this study will really blow your mind to see that and remind us we are 
we what we really truly want to achieve in our lives okay let's look at it what keeps us healthy and happy as we go through life if you were going to invest now in your future best self where would you put your time and your energy there was a recent survey of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were and over 80% said that a major life goal for them was to get rich and another 50% of those same young adults said that another major life goal was to become famous <laughs> and we're constantly told to lean in to work to push harder <laughs> and achieve more we're given the impression that these are the things that we need to go after in order to have a good life pictures of entire lives of the choices that people make and how those choices work out for them those pictures are almost impossible to get most of what we know about human life we know from asking people to remember the past and as we know hindsight is anything but 2020 we forget vast amounts of what happens to us in life and sometimes memory is downright creative but what if we could watch entire lives as they unfold through time what if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way into old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy we did that the harvard study of adult development may be the longest study of adult life that's ever been done for 75 years we've tracked the lives of 724 men year after year asking about their work their home lives their health and of course asking all along the way without knowing how their life stories were going to turn out studies like this are exceedingly rare almost all projects of this kind fall apart within a decade because too many people drop out of the study or funding for the research dries up or the researchers get distracted or they die and nobody moves the ball further down the field but through a combination of luck and the persistence of several generations of researchers this study has survived about 60 of our original 724 men are still alive still participating in the study most of them in their 90s and we are now beginning to study the more than 2000 children of these men and i'm the fourth director of the study <laughs> since 1938 we've tracked the lives of two groups of men the first group started in the study when they were sophomores at harvard college they all finished college during world war II, and then most went off to serve in the war and the second group that we've followed was a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods boys who were chosen for the study specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s most lived in tenements many without hot and cold running water when they entered the study all of these teenagers were interviewed they were given medical exams we went to their homes and we interviewed their parents and then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life they became factory workers and lawyers and bricklayers and doctors one president of the united states some developed alcoholism a few developed schizophrenia some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the very top and some made that journey in the opposite direction the founders of this study would never in their wildest dreams have imagined that i would be standing here today 75 years later telling you that the study still continues 
Every two years, our patient and dedicated research staff calls up our men and asks them if we can send them yet one more set of questions about their lives. Many of the inner city Boston men ask us, why do you keep wanting to study me? My life just isn't that interesting. The Harvard men never ask that question. <laughs> To get the clearest picture of these lives, we don't just send them questionnaires. We interview them in their living rooms. We get their medical records from their doctors. We draw their blood. We scan their brains. We talk to their children. We videotape them talking with their wives about their deepest concerns. And when, about a decade ago, we finally asked the wives if they would join us as members of the study, many of the women said, you know, it's about time. <laughs> So what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives? Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us and that loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High conflict marriages, for example, without much affection, turn out to be very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. And living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. Once we had followed our men all the way into their 80s, we wanted to look back at them at midlife and to see if we could predict who was going to grow into a happy, healthy octogenarian and who wasn't. And when we gathered together everything we knew about them at age 50, it wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 50. Good, close relationships seem to buffer us from some of the slings and arrows of getting old. Our most happily partnered men and women reported in their 80s that on the days when they had more physical pain, their moods stayed just as happy. But the people who were in unhappy relationships on the days when they reported more physical pain, it was magnified by more emotional pain. And the third big lesson that we learn about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protective. That the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. And those good relationships, they don't have to be smooth all the time. Some of our octogenarian couples could 
bicker with each other day in and day out. But as long as they felt that they could really count on the other when the going got tough, those arguments didn't take a toll on their memories. So, this message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being, this is wisdom that's as old as the hills. Why is this so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we'd really like is a quick fix, something we can get that'll make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated, and the, the hard work of tending to family and friends, that's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong. It never ends. The people in our 75-year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. Just like the millennials in that recent survey, many of our men, when they were starting out as young adults, really believed that fame and wealth and high achievement were what they needed to go after to have a good life. But over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So what about you? Let's say you're 25, or you're 40, or you're 60. What might leaning into relationships even look like? Well, the possibilities are practically endless. It might be something as simple as replacing screen time with people time, or livening up a stale relationship by doing something new together, long walks or date nights, or reaching out to that family member who you haven't spoken to in years, because those all-too-common family feuds take a terrible toll on the people who hold the grudges. I'd like to close with a quote from Mark Twain. More than a century ago, he was looking back on his life, and he wrote this. There isn't time, so brief is life, for bickerings, apologies, heart burnings, callings to account. There is only time for loving, and but an instant, so to speak, for that. The good life is built with good relationships. Thank you. <laughs>
the mother estimated about eight, eight, nine thousand, ten thousand dollars. It didn't really work because he still had his panic attacks, his anxiety attacks in the army. Uh, he was a clerk. Um, there were also issues with uh, his emotions. He was very uh, frustrated and he was shout at home and, and get all emotional and all that. And a lot of emotional regulation issues. All right, I was brought in um, to work with him. And my the unique thing that I do is I work, I go to the family home because I'm all about my practice is all about working with families, right? Restoring relationships. And usually for, if it's a young person, whether it's a child, a, a, a teenager or a young adult, I would first see the parents because I want to do my, my BPSS plus other stuff assessment of the relationship. And I found that he had right, uh, PTSD because the father had an addiction. And as the eldest child of his family, he was um, uh, seen as to, that needs to perform. And when he doesn't perform well, he will be uh, ridiculed, you know, and physically hurt even when he was younger, All right? And um, yeah, so, and that, that affected him, All right? So when his results uh, for his exam came out, it fell short of expectation. Basically, it's like you're getting like A's and B's. When the result came out, you got B's and C's and D's. Uh, right? And she could not take it. And that's where it spiraled down. So I, so I established a lot about the social, the relationship. Uh, father cried. And as he shared with me, please help my son. Right? do whatever it takes if he if if i you need me to to uh work out with him i will right um yeah so he's very remorseful uh what he has had happened he's still battling his addiction actually um and but i work worth with him and the, and i look through all his social aspect he's withdrawing from his friends so I worked on, and we, by the third session with him at his home, I was able to connect with him as usual. And that's my, my style that I work with youth. By the third session, the mother was sharing with me, I can see a difference in him already that I have not seen for a long time since before he went to the army. But the fourth session, he was back uh, to, to gym to exercise. And he was going back to church, connecting with his friends again, all right? And by the fifth session, he shared with me that his penny attack has, during that five months I was with him, uh, within that, that four, four months, um, there was only one penny attack. It was a very minor one after some incident with the in the, in the uh, army, right? Um, and thereafter, um, um, it was deemed as successful and it took five sessions to work out with him the issues as I go through the process of working through with him, right? Of course, there's one other, one outstanding thing is about reconciliation with the father. That, and this is where I specialize in working with men. This is one area um, because this is, I found one of the critical issues that is affecting many families is the role of the man as a husband and father, right? And that is my speciality because I myself have to walk my own journey as a husband, as a son, and as a husband, right? And as a father, my, my, my own mother has OCD, right? And I think because of that, I grew that interest to become what I am, you know, to study psychology and social work, right, and, and counseling psychology, to be able to do. And so you can see in my life, um, bad things has happened when I was 16, right, in a crisis I went through. I had actually 
not diagnosed officially. Actually, if I look back and I, I look go through my own assessment with, with my doctor friend, you don't you have clinical psycho, uh, clinical depression, uh, basically. Uh, right? And it's through that crisis, it became an opportunity for me to look into my life and seek direction through my spiritual faith, right? And the connection with so many people in my life, right? The many friends I have in church, right? The older men, the older uh, women that I can be my mentors that will help me through that, that, that connection I had with them, the trust I had, you know, and the faith that they have in me, all right? Build me up with so many other people that have guided me through, all right? So it's now I'm able to do what I do to, to, to give back, to be able to help other families in trouble, right? And they will be troubled. The issue is usually the men are not ready or willing or even ready to face up to it, right? And this is where, that's why you can see my work in the, the Dads for Life movement. I'm still with the Center for Fathering in the special Dads for Life, right? And other programs I've done, right? In, in many places to uplift right, the importance of men, right? Um, I think um, with, given the time, I just want to uh, maybe not cover the rest, uh, but maybe open up to, to the any of you to ask questions because it's already over 8.23 already. Right? Okay, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian, uh, for your for your sharing, for all the videos. It was really en enlightening. And yeah. also about awareness uh, that yeah. it's not uh, just about the physical health, it's about the psychological health, the social, social health, and also the spiritual health that is able to make us connected and our relationship is so important. All right, so is there any questions uh, from... Is there any questions? For those who, because I, saw other, because I saw the other people asking for connection, if you can take a photograph of these things, you can find me on, on various channels here. Lah. Whether it's a website or LinkedIn or Facebook, I'm, I'm there. So you can take a picture of this, then you can connect with me if you want to. Because the, you know the chats we had, right? Well, how to connect with that person and all that. Yeah, Just take this picture will do. Yes, any questions hey. back to us? Is there any questions that you want to ask, uh, Adrian? Adrian, is there any uh, workshop or program that they can attend? Uh, you can give them special or, or something. So, um, I, I'm okay. Put it this way, uh, I my my perspective uh, is the family. Work to me is a hobby, <laughs> right? And I, uh, I I will organize things when people uh, ask me to because I'm actor trained. I can turn uh, any program around to be. I, I've, I've turned many of the Western programs into Asian programs or Singaporean programs, right? So I'm, I, I always wait for opportunities, right? To, to if, if you have a, a society or religious institution who would like me to come in to do all sorts of talks, right? I, uh, I can do it, right? But I do not um, uh, work so H-A-R-D, put it this way, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, sure. And um, uh, can any of our attendees at, um, uh, have uh, maybe one-to-one -one, uh, sharing? Yeah, yeah. yeah or, I, mean, I mean, once you uh, can connect with me, whether through the messenger or connect with me through LinkedIn, right? Or send an uh, email to me in my uh, in Adrian at familypsychologist.sg. I will I will get back, you know, and um, and I'm not the type of um, clinician who do many 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 sessions. One, I always do do believe in short sharp and go to the point, right? And that's why most of my sessions are by five six sessions. If uh, typically you will will settle the issue, even if it cannot because there needs is more if there are more complications that needs other specialists to come in, I will refer them out, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, right. so so I usually go to the home, but now cannot go home, right? Go to the home, right? Uh, actually, <laughs> right? And why the home? Because as you know, uh, from your all webinars, uh, to 
to so for someone to come into a clinic, uh, number one, I pay a lot of rent, for, for, forget it, you know. Number two, I would want to see the environment where you are living in, you know. And uh, a picture paints a thousand words, lah, right? Like last year, I, I had uh, one boy, a P6 boy last year. Parents were desperate because suddenly uh, he developed obsessive compulsive behaviors, you know. He don't allow people into his room. If he drops something on the floor, you he won't wear or you will have to throw things away. You know, quite scary for a 12 year old one, small little boy, right? Um, and, and gets very hot tempered and shout back, you know, um, and scream. Uh, all because of the pandemic. You know, they have never seen this before, right? And I went to the home, I can see the environment and to work with them. But for him, I told the the parents that they need more specialized help that is already existing programs that they can go to and I'll refer, right? I'm not there to, to, to carry on and on, but uh, because of my network, I can refer them to many uh, opportunities. I'll tell you, okay, this one can go, this one cannot go, you know, right? Uh, you know, kind of thing. And many many of my clients, past clients, I, I already like over, uh, I over, we're over 1,300 families, right? Um, they, many of us have seen psychiatrists, psychologists. Then they come to me, uh, in one, two session, they can understand what is happening to your child, right? Because I use a very holistic, whole person perspective, right? And, and I, I will help them understand, right? Rather than outsource it, I would want the family member, the caregivers to work uh, and to understand so that I will more like teach them how to fish rather than give the fish, lah, right? So, and if I work with uh, families with children, children or adults with special needs, right? Again, I went to a home for example before. The son about 30, in the 30s uh, have, ne- have not left the house for about four years. Uh. He's putting on about six legs clothing, right? And he still feels cold, you know? So these are the challenges and I, I, would, I would refer them, you know, because they have, nobody wants to go to the house, right? Because they always go, go to the clinic, go to the clinic, right? So this is my 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 practice that I do, lah, right? Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So thank you so much, uh, Adrian, for your insightful sharing. And uh, for any one of you who wants to connect with Adrian, uh, you can email to him, you can WhatsApp him, you can go into his messenger to uh, message him as well. So uh, now just to go on, uh, yeah. If you haven't have your acugraph analysis done, you can always make an appointment with us. We are at Adelphi B137 and we also will give you some free therapy uh, to service your body while you're still young and healthy. So don't take good health for granted. And you can drink, uh, bring your drinking water for us to test as well. And um, have, have you submitted your floor plan for auditing? All right, don't stay in a toxic house. If it is affected by geopathic stress and if there's a solution to harmonize your house, uh, please don't stay in a toxic house, all right? Every day is a happy day. Every day is, um, is a joyful day and that will make your life very interesting and they, that will make your life very meaningful, all right? Don't stay in a house that is always having conflicts and having war. Now, uh, this is our Facebook group, uh, Wellness for Good Dot Energy. Uh, our uh, recorded videos are all inside. Our uh, uh, recorded uh, webinars of the past sessions are all inside. So you can always, always go back and watch the webinar again. Now, this is my contact number, 8693-9472. You, uh, you can uh, just WhatsApp me, free energy therapy. We'll be able to make appointment for you. So all of us take care of our health. Then we can fulfill our long-term vision to create a world full of healthy and wealthy people. Now, this coming, um, this coming uh, Monday, okay, don't forget to tune in, uh, is by Teresa Siu. She's a TV host, international wellness speaker. She, she, uh, she's a mental and health educator, a lifestyle nutritionist. She's also a lecturer. She's going to share about Be Happy, be well, all right? Her hypnosis is, this is an integrative workshop using integrative holistic tools to boost the mental health well-being through breath, through sound, through movement, through quieting and holistic nutrition. 
Teresa will speak about ways on staying sane in good times and in bad times. She will share cases and experiences on global pandemic, on being positive in this most unprecedented time and how to strike the right balance going forward. So learn from Teresa, the fundamental lifestyle adaptations to quickly shift your mentality and perspective to good energy to thrive and to succeed. Be well and be happy. So interact with, um, interact with Teresa and gain more insights to nurture yourself and your loved ones. All right. So this is her hypnosis and that's what she's going to share. Be happy, be well on Monday, 28th of June. Now, the other thing that I want to share with you is our closing. Our closing on the 10th of July is we have a guest speaker and this guest speaker is Dr. Darren Chua. Now, he is an MBBS medical doctor and uh, he, he received a Young Outstanding Singaporean Successful Entrepreneur Award. He's the founder of Mindset Transformation and also the founder of Potter's Clay Education. So he is a very, very inspiring speaker. He's going to share with you how he actually uh, got a stroke. He went into depression and how he actually get out from his depression and become an in international inspirational speaker, an author, an edupreneur, a national para athletes, and also champion for the youth and for all of us that are differently able. All right. So it will be a very, very inspiring closing um, um, uh, speech by this uh, Dr. Darren Chua. All right. So stay on to the end of the submit and you're going to learn so much from every of the speakers. All right. So uh, is there any last question for Adrian before we close for the night? You can unmute yourself. Any last question for Adrian? Hi, I'm Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, Adrian. Can I just check? Do your patient uh, actually uh, 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 having a uh, medication with them? That, uh, that means they actually seen a psychiatrist and on medication yep. before they yep. actually see you? Yeah, some of them are already. Um, but you see, the usually the psychiatrist will work with the psychologist together. Right, yep. because yeah, so it depends yep. on on the nature of the issues involved too, right? Like for example, that one that the case that I shared earlier, right? Um, yes. The, the 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 young man was uh, still on medication, but apparently the earlier medication, uh, despite the the PhD in clinical psychologist who worked with him, uh, didn't didn't make much breakthrough with him. Right, so, so it's really uh, taking a holistic approach, a comprehensive approach to understanding the perspective, right? And I go into areas that are not taught in in graduate studies, right? About what I call psycho spirituality, right? Not, nothing, nothing to do with with spirits and all, but it's a lot to do with the relationship and your connection with your own who you are. Right and your identity, I can tell you, because many of us, like I, I shared with my supervisees, uh, have this notion or this situation called the orphan identity, right? That can come about as we grow up. That has to be addressed, right? And this is a pastor a, always say you are the child of God, why? Right? So your identity will be a child yeah. of God. Yeah, <laughs> but you must you must know how how to, how to deeply. You, well, you know at the head, how about the heart and, the, and your spirit? You need to internalize that. And so many of us do not understand that unless we further explore, right? Not only with the, 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 the client or the patient, but also with the family environment. It has to be holistic, right? Uh, uh, the parent who is not practicing cannot expect the child to be practicing in their faith also, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's so important to be congruent, to be uh, modeling after. And that's where I work both with the, with the parents and or the caregiver, parents or, and the child together. I, by the way, I've actually just seen parents uh, on their, both parents and coach them 
not even seeing the child or the teenager at all because the teenager refused to see anybody. That kind of animosity, right? But through just working with the parents, getting their perspective right, right, their practices and their relationship, right, there can be breakthroughs, right? So my approach is very different. Many of the, you see, they will see the patient, the patient, the patient, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, our child got a problem, you know, sorry, uh, we are a system, uh, right? That's we, it, medicine. <laughs> That's yeah. what my doctor tell me. Yeah, we have to work together, right? And and if you want your, your child or your or your even I I've I have seen uh children, uh, adult children get asking me to see their parents in their seventies, uh, uh are having marital issues, uh, you know. But uh, issue <laughs> very much how how to actually work together, right, as a family unit, right? And right, because, we don't have much time already, yeah. yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Adrian. So, Cindy, you. you can connect with Adrian yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in, independently and uh, let's solve your family issue and always live a happy life, all right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, very thanks much, thanks everybody. Us. Yes. Right. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, Goodbye. I want to say a good night to every one of you and have a sweet dream, sleep well, and we connect again on Monday evening, all right? Yes, yes. Who will be sharing? Thank you. Thank good night. You. Good night, good everybody. Night. Good 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 night.